of frustration. Full of despair. From years of hurt, disappointment and relegation. Two British football fans have had enough. Canary Bird Elliot Holman and Wanderer Henry Hewitt are in search of glory, pride, passion, in search of silverware. And they found Major League Soccer. Welcome to another episode of the MLS UK show. I'm Elliot Holman. And I'm Henry Hewitt. And we are back once again. Bit of a, a bit of a more lengthy episode, something for you to get your teeth into as we look back at recent events in MLS. We do some predictions. I've got a game with the changing name for you. And I will pass you over to my esteemed colleague, co-presenter, Henry Hewitt, who will share with you what he's been up to. Yes. So as you would have seen by the title of this episode, we have a special guest on the show today. Uh, you'll know him from MLS season passes wrap up. You'll also know him from being a former MLS player. But if like me, you are a Bolton Wanderers fan, which I know there's very few who will <laughs> watch or listen to this. Uh, he also is a former Bolton Wanderers player. The first one, the first former Bolton Wanderers player on the podcast, Nigel Rio Coker. He's joining us. Um, we had Gillian Sakovitz on the other week, of course. Now we've got her wrap-up co-star, um, Nigel Rio Coca. And, uh, yeah, you weren't able to make this uh, interview, so I took it on. Uh, and I'll be honest with you, I was quite excited because he is a former Bolton player. Uh, and it was a good chat. I'm looking forward to everyone hearing it. Uh, I, is that correct? Is that factually correct, that he's the first former Bolton player we've had? Because it feels like we mention Bolton every week. Well, I try to, but yeah, Lawrence White was born in Bolton, I think, or he played for Bolton U team, but didn't actually play for the first team. So yeah, Nigel Rio Coca, um, he played for us in the Premier League and uh, it was only one season, but yeah, he, uh, he did play for us. And uh, and yeah, he's, uh, he then went on after that. He played for Ipswich for 10 games. I'm sure you'd be delighted to know. Uh. Uh, well, he went from there to uh, Vancouver, then Chivas USA. He played for Montreal. Um, he only played 30 games for them, but in that time he got to a Champions League final and played uh, with Didier Drogba. So not not bad. Not uh, not a bad accolade to uh, cram into 30-odd games for them. I uh, Just hearing you speak of his career path has reminded me that uh, we need to do a game with a changing name. And this is one that I'm quite excited about because I think... I think it's a bit tougher than the uh, than the last one that you absolutely smashed. Yeah. Um, now, for regular viewers and listeners of this podcast, you'll know that uh, we haven't been in the studio that much so far this season, and we tend to just keep game with with changing names too when we're in the studio. Uh, so we've only done a few, and I think you're easing me in to the season. So now we're now what like nine weeks in, ten weeks in. Yeah, you're gonna have to give me a tougher one. Okay, uh, so this is the Anton Walks game with a changing name. It's a player who has played in the UK and in MLS. I will read you their career path. You have to work out who it is. Comments below if you're watching on YouTube. Of course, you can tweet us at MLS UK show. Uh, or of course, you can just drop us an email as well. Hello at MLS.show. Are you ready? Yes. They started their career in 2011... At PSV. Ooh, Holland. Then, yes. Then they moved to Brighton and Hove Albion in 2018. And they were with Brighton permanently until 2022. Do you have any idea so far? Um, no. Where did he go after that? Well, then, a loan to MLS from Brighton. There's not been many of those, I can tell you. So that might help you narrow it down a little bit. Um, if you're struggling, I'll give you the team later on. Uh, they also um, played for VFL, um, Persepolis. Uh, and then, what country even is this? Uh, Chinese Super League as well. Three appearances so far in 2023 in the Chinese Super League. Wow. What a, it seems like after Brighton uh, and then the MLS team, it seems that he's he's just going on a tour, a world tour. And remember, uh, well, I say remember, I didn't give you the MLS team. It wasn't a good season. <laughs> 
Right. Well, if you know, then get in touch, as Elliot said. Stick it in the comments at MLS UK Show, also on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok. Uh, and he will reveal all at the end of the episode. Um, it's a tough one, this. I mean, we're recording this in the morning, and my I think it, my brain do not wake up till about 2 o'clock anyway, so uh, it is a tough one. But, uh, yeah, I'll get thinking. While we uh, while we play out the Nigel Rio Coker interview, I'll get thinking. <laughs> okay, um, I'll, I won't be. I'll, I'm excited to hear this, apart from all of the mentions of Bolton Wanderers. <laughs> I can assure you there's only a few, but uh, yeah, thank you um, for Nigel for joining us on the podcast. He's, uh, you know, obviously well known in this country. He's well known now in the US for his MLS uh, career and also working on Apple TV's MLS season pass wrap up show. Uh, so here it is. Here's my chat with former Bolton player as well as Vancouver, Montreal and Chivas USA, Nigel Rio Coca. The MLS UK Show. Okay, so joining us now on the MLS UK Show is a man who I'm very excited to come on the show because of out of all the footballers we've had, he is the first former Bolton Wanderers player to come on to the show. You'll know him from his MLS career. You'll know him from being an analyst on MLS Season Pass. Ladies and gentlemen, Nigel Rio Coker is on the show. Thank you for having me. How are you, Nigel? Where are you at the moment? Are you uh, where are you based? Because it's uh, we're recording. It's half two in the afternoon here in the UK. It's very early where you are. Nine thirty in the morning, nearly in uh, Florida, the Sunshine State. Nice, nice. Uh, yeah, but I guess the the weather's a lot different here. I'm in Manchester. It's grey skies. It's dry, which is a bonus, but grey skies. So I'm guessing you win on that one. Well, let's be real. It's always raining in Manchester anyway. So, you know, I haven't forgotten my time in England. I know what it's like. Yes, of course. Uh, I do want to talk about your career in a moment. But first of all, I think we should talk about uh, your role with Apple TV on MLS Season Pass. We've got used to seeing you now, um, you know, as one of the analysts on the, um, you know, the countdown show and the wrap up show. I mean, I know you've done TV stuff before, but I mean, this as Apple's really raised the game, right? Yeah, it's, it's changed. It's the first time um, that this has ever been done from a footballing perspective. And it's more so for consumers. It's the fact of fans can basically get to watch their team instantly on demand. And I think with this deal, what people don't realise is it's a worldwide deal. This isn't just for the American audience. This is anyone around the world could sign up to this MLS uh, Apple season pass and watch MLS games Within, just basically on their phone instantly. So that, I think that's what's groundbreaking about it. We're seeing the technology that's being used. We're seeing the interface with Apple, being able to interact with the teams that you're following. And if you're new to it, being able to find out about the team. So it really is a, a big, big project and it's something new. Yeah, because I remember when it was announced, I kind of was thinking, oh, well, this is nice, I guess, but you know, it'd be great for the US audience. And then it was like, oh, wait, no, we can get it here in the UK as well. This is a a worldwide thing and yeah for us you know I'm sure you're aware beforehand the guys on Sky Sports did a great job but we had very limited access to it now we can watch every game we can watch all the highlight shows the the stuff you guys do it's just amazing yeah I think that's what it is it's it's the the access it's the way that football is consumed now it's changed so much and I think what again you said it, it's so groundbreaking because of how Apple have done it and it's a worldwide audience that can watch it any time that you want, the content is there. I think what people have to realise as well is it's so new that it's still early. You know, as good as it looks already, there's still room to grow and there's things that could change to make it even better than it is now. But from a perspective of what we've seen so far that's been achieved, it really is something to marvel at. And um, it could be the way a lot of footballing leagues around the world start heading. Yeah, exactly. And I think, uh, you know, for the Premier League here in the UK, it's I think that major leagues like that will start to look at what MLS is doing with Apple. And uh, yeah, I think it's only a matter of time that everyone else joins in and uh, and does something similar. Um, I'm going to I want to talk to you about what's happening this season in MLS very soon, uh, Nigel. But before that, I want to talk about your career, especially as much as I'd love to talk about Bolton. Uh, we're going to pass Bolton pass then going to Ipswich just afterwards and then start with you joining Vancouver in MLS. I mean, before that, because as you said there, the access now is probably at its its highest for us in the UK. It wasn't as accessible back then. What did you know about MLS? What did you learn? And what were your first impressions of the league? 
I learned a lot from uh, my American friends, you know, people who came from the league. I'm talking like the likes of Brad Guzan, who uh, I'm very good friends with and still with um, uh, Stuart Holding and, and people who played there. So I learned about it. I knew it was growing. And it's one of those situations where you, I could see the potential. And like you said, the access wasn't there. It wasn't easy to get games, but a few people in England were still able to keep up with games. And that's when... I think the time when I went there after that was when the likes of Dempsey went back and and uh, some of the American um, international players went back and the league just continued to grow. So you could see the growth potential. And um, it was an interesting experience. You know, everything football-wise that I look for, I look for the learning experience of it. You know, you never stop learning in football. You never stop learning about culture and consumption. And you never stop learning about the players that you play with, you know, the different backgrounds they come from, the nations they come from, and how football is consumed. I think one thing that was good about the MLS was it was a real big melting pot and it had the capability to have probably the most international demographic in world football. Yeah, exactly. Because this is what we say on the podcast is that, you know, I think if you are a fan of, say, NFL or you're a fan of NBA, it is the, it's a US way of doing the league that we love. And, you know, MLS isn't trying to compete with the Premier League. It's doing its own thing. And I think that sort of, you know, Americanism or American way of doing it, whether it be the All-Star game, the playoffs, uh, no promotion relegation, I think, uh, yeah, I think when you're into football, I think it's a great way to just see how it is done in that, you know, in America. And I to see it growing is is fantastic. Yeah, it, it has grown a lot. I remember my time at Vancouver and then I, was, I still speak to people at the club and just a change in the club in, in the sense of facilities and things along those lines. I think that the, the difficult thing that's going to be hard for the league is to continue to progress is, is building that real consistency with some clubs. And again, it's it's management as well, you know, getting the right managers and the right coaches in there. I think that's going to be the progression because if you want to compare it, like you said, any league in, in football, you want to compare it to the world's league, the best leagues, and you want to have to be able to get attract and get the best managers, the best coaches. And now again, just remember how much of the infancy the league is in, in the sense it's kind of just introduced the academy system now a bit, where it's the MLS next. So that's still so early in its infancy and that has to get embedded. But I, I've seen great, progression from my time of playing to what I'm seeing now. So when you uh, joined Vancouver, um, am I right in thinking that Portland had your discovery rights? Is oh, yeah. Right? Yeah, I mean, again, for the listeners or people who might not know, it's, it's, it's a difficult situation because some clubs can own your rights without signing you and then it's a trading thing. I'm not going to lie, I wasn't a big fan of that. I didn't really like that aspect of it, but that's how the league is run. Um, and for me, it made it difficult because it made the the whole movement to there become a lot more difficult because I had no understanding of the workings of it. You know, just, I was just eager just to play football. I was eager to play and go and play for a club and, you know, like I said, see the potential and the growth. And um, it is what it is. It's part of the journey. And also, I think what people have to understand, the trading aspect of it as well, how players are traded and you can just have to uproot your family and move and go somewhere else. That is a difficult thing to to be able to swallow and handle as well. So it's it's not um, as easy as people think it is. It is really difficult and that side of it does drain and, and, and become stressful on family life as well. So did you know anything about this? Because what I'm intrigued by is you hear all the time that, oh, San Jose has Messi's rights. Like, do you ever find that out? Or do you, is it just when you try and sign, they go, no. oh, by the way, Portland have exactly. got your rights? I had no idea about it. I had no idea about it. Don't know how that becomes a thing that a club can kind of own your rights without you knowing so it was new to me it was new to me and it was uh it's things that players can't control and it's almost most so in the the offices up top and they control all those things and again like i said it was new to me and then also the 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 trading thing was a, a difficult thing to swallow as well because you come from a european league where players have a bit more rights they'll say in whether they want to move somewhere don't want to move somewhere um, and over here, obviously, you can be traded. And I saw a few players traded and I left Vancouver as well. And again, that whole scenario is not something that's easily done. And it is very difficult on players, but it, it's how the league operates. Who knows? Maybe they might try and change that a bit slightly in the future, but it, it can be difficult on the players. 
Yeah, I mean, we don't see that as fans, is that we get excited by the trades and all of that sort of stuff, but we don't think of the impact it does have on the players. And I guess if we're seeing more players, uh, you know, like it could be like Thiago Almeida now being linked with uh, Europe and signing for millions of pounds, if it's going that way, yeah, I think so. You'd like to think that it would start to go into the European style of transfers where it's then, oh, well, players will sign for millions rather than... Uh, just being traded or discovery rights and all of that stuff, I guess. Yeah, I think it's just ways to find the best way to, for the league to evolve and grow. And I think I always look at comparisons, obviously my time growing in England. I think the best way to grow your league is domestically. I think it's domestically into the cities that you're in and catering to the local community because that's where your support and your fan base is going to come from. You've got to make your city special. And that's going in and producing and continuing to develop young talent that comes through in and around your city and that way the fan base will grow and want to buy into it because they see local kids who grew up in there coming through their club and, and you continue to, to kind of grow that um, legend, that homegrown legend, that nurturing, that talent. And then everything else above that you can sprinkle on top. You know, you can get top talented foreign players, but the biggest growth of my experience of playing in the Premier League is remembering the times of when you see the likes of Rio Ferdinand, Joe Cole, and all them not coming through West Ham. You've got John Terry, Jody Morris, all them not, and Frank uh, coming through Ch Chelsea. You know, Steven Gerrard coming through Liverpool, Jamie Carragher. So we all saw that. And it was about that special community and coming through these clubs. And you still see young players coming through clubs. And I think that's what really is the foundation of football. I think that's the greatest foundation of local players coming through their clubs you grow it in the sense of your community and it goes on to bigger and, and better things. Yeah, well, hopefully with the introduction of like uh, MLS Next Pro and stuff like that, that we'll start to see that yeah. grow more and more. Um, so you left Vancouver, had a spell at Chivas USA and then went to Montreal where you captained them in the Champions League finals uh, in both legs. Of, of course, we've seen at the moment it's the semis. As we speak now, it's about to be the first leg of uh, Philadelphia versus LAFC. Um, what will be going through those players' minds? Because they're that close to such a big event in the final. You, of course, played an FA Cup final as well, so you're more you're used to the semi-finals. What sort of pressure will they be under to deliver? Um, I think um, for LAFC, they'll probably be the more favoured ones. I think LAFC, for me so far, is, is a very well-run club. Um, they've got strength in depth in numbers in next man stepping up. Um, they've got the eyes on them because obviously again it's LA it's something new but they're very successful and they're well coached I don't think LAFC will feel as much pressure more so as as, as Philadelphia Union again it's uh, that the mental side of it will be it's the replay of the MLS Cup final so they're facing each other again and when you go this far in the Champions League it's kind of becomes a priority and it's like anything else in world football it's the same as in europe where certain clubs get this far semi-finals in the champions league that's probably going to be their priority and i think that that's where lafc will be looking at to win this competition and again this computation competitions changed a lot you know my time of playing there the reality of it was it was dominated by mexican clubs you know mexican clubs were the top one percent and constantly winning it every year uh, and then now you're seeing the growth in the league that, you know, a lot of MLS clubs are getting to the final. And then you had last year's winners were Portland and uh, went and represented MLS in the World Club Championship. I think that the the, the, the pendulum of favour would probably swing in LAFC's favour at the moment more so when it comes to the whole pressure in the moment and everything that's going on in their mind right now. So do you think then, because, of course, last year we did have that MLS winner for the first time in years, do you think there's there's more pressure on um, LAFC or Philadelphia to make it back-to-back, -back, or do you think there's now less pressure? I think there's less pressure. I just think that the win by, um, sorry, Seattle won it. The win, the win by Seattle last year um, just makes it that more achievable. I think there's a belief there now that, you know, MLS clubs can go and win this competition you know i feel that even when we played in our time we should have won it i feel that the margins were so tight and we were let's just say an unselfish pass away from winning it but i'm not going to go back into that but um yeah i i, I really do feel that the, the, the gap has golfed and it just shows the competitiveness of where the mls is kind of slowly getting it's not there yet but it's still it, it's close 
So let's have a look then at uh, modern day MLS, MLS of this season. I saw in a recent interview you said at this stage of a season, you're more looking at how a team plays on the pitch rather than the standings. So in that case then, who's impressed you so far in, in what you've seen in MLS? I'd have to say for me, um, the four teams that have impressed me the most are the four in the top, well, New England, Cincinnati, San Jose and LAFC. And I look at the the style of play and for me, it's the consistency of the style of play. Yes, they one or two might have had indifferent results throughout, but you know what you're going to get week in, week out. And I think for me, it's that consistency factor is what you need to pay attention to. You know, I think Atlanta United are there, but not fully there because they've been more inconsistent out of those four teams. Those four teams for me have played, oh, sorry, and Seattle. Those four teams for me have played the best football, or those five teams have played the best football that I have seen on a consistent basis. Oh, I forgot, sorry, one more team. St. Louis as well. Jesus Christ. Okay, so this is what happens when you talk football, you get so into it. But those teams there have, have probably been the best teams I've seen consistently in, in having an identity and also being consistent and, you know, showing signs of when they go behind, having the character to come back and take a point at least. Those are get great traits to see so early on in the season. Yeah, I mean, don't worry. Like, we cover every team as well, and it's so difficult remembering, like, with the amount of times we've done an episode, gone, right, thanks for watching, see you next time, and then gone, I didn't talk about Cincinnati. Like, oh, right, re-record. But, uh, yeah, so don't worry about that. Um, I want to ask you, though, about a team who who have underwhelmed a little bit, considering how the, the plays they've got. Uh, Toronto. Um, they lost, as we speak, they lost at the weekend to Philadelphia. Have you been disappointed so far with how Toronto have done? I, have, I haven't seen anything. And I just, like I said about those teams before previously, they have a style of play, a consistency that I can see a, an identity. I don't see an identity in Toronto. I see a team that really has spent a lot of money in two talented strike forces in Insigne and Bernadeschi, but they're not currently delivering at the moment. And then I don't see a team foundation behind them that's built to support them. So for me, again, Toronto, again, it's just, uh, it's kind of what you expect. And I think the biggest thing and worry for Toronto is not seeing that identity, you know, not seeing that that basic kind of pattern of play of who they are. I think they're still trying to work out who they are. And you're already nine or nine games into the season. And that's a, a, a difficult stage to come into. And, you know, I think that for me, it will be a big failure for them not to win MLS Cup this year because of the fact I still can't remember a more talented two attacking strikers in league history that they possess in Insignia and Bernadeschi and not being able to win MLS Cup because you know scoring goals is one of the hardest things to do in, in world football and they have two super talented players who can do that so you would have to say they have the edge and uh, at the moment it's very underwhelming. Uh, do you think, like, perhaps in a, a change from when you were playing in MLS, do you think now that it is more important to have a solid defence? I think MLS in recent years has been more, if you've got a good attack, you can score 70, you can see 60, but you'll still be successful. Do you think there's more of an emphasis on the defence now? There should have always been an emphasis on defence. I think the, um, it's just common sense. You know, we've watched world football. If you're a football fan like I am, you watch world football. Great championship winning sides and title winning teams start off with a great foundation of defense. I think that it's interesting you say that because when even you look at world football, there's been a lot that's gone away from teaching the basics of defending to now wanting defenders to be able to play out the back and play football. So now you've got football playing defenders, but then when it comes to the art of defending and sensing danger, knowing danger and doing your job first, that's gone. And that comes from coaching. But I think that the, 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 a strong defence is the biggest foundation you can have in any football to win a title or to win a competition. You have to be able to defend. And I think that there's the, those few teams that I mentioned at the start, you look at them, the like St. Louis, Seattle, LAFC, um, Cincinnati, New England, there and San Jose, they're one of the few teams when you watch them play and you watch them out of possession, they still look comfortable defensively. They don't look erratic. They don't look disorganized they don't look all over the place and that is why they're able to be on the consistent run that they're on right now because defending is their foundation and the basic bread and butter and they all do it well enough to help them win games well another team who were uh, well until this past weekend haven't really defended or attacked well so far this season has been la galaxy 
Uh, they finally got the first win against Austin. Of course, we are recording this just after this uh, that game. It will go out next week. So who knows how they'll do against Orlando at the weekend. But um, uh, there's a lot going on at LA Galaxy at the moment. Uh, the fans aren't happy. How do you see it from the outside? I mean, can they recapture some form and, and make the playoffs? I think they could probably recapture some form and make the playoffs because they've got uh, Chicharito. You know, he's a talented player. But there are still a lot of vulnerabilities when I watch them play. And again, you talk about defensively. They've been one of the poorest defensively, poorest defensive team I've seen in watching their games. Very vulnerable when it comes to counter-attacking, not organised all over the place. So there's always going to be that vulnerability of conceding goals. And I think like Chicharito said about um, the LA derby, that you know they gave us goals and we didn't give them. We, we gave them goals and they didn't give us goals. That just sums up the defensive side of things. I think what I like about it, obviously, there are things going on outside the club with fans and unrest. I think what, I, for me, liking about that as a football fan is it's showing that fans care. It's showing that fans care about their club and, you know, want their club to do well and succeed. And for me, I can only applaud that because that's what football is about. You know, football is about the fans. It's about the community and the fans showing their frustrations because the fans want to compete and want to be successful is something that I admire. Yeah, I mean, of course, all fans care about the club, but you do sense with LA Galaxy, they, there's just that little bit extra there where they truly do care. Maybe it's because they've seen success and now they're not having it. So uh, when you've seen that, you uh, you appreciate that more. And then you, uh, yeah, when you're not doing so well, it, it hurts a bit more than others. Um, I want to ask you as well about Phil Neville and Inter Miami. They, they started well, they've dropped off. He's under pressure now. Um, I mean... You could argue that if he was managing in the UK in the Premier League, he would have been sacked by now. Do you sense in MLS that managers do get a bit more time, possibly because there is no relegation? Oh, yeah, for sure. Managers definitely do get a lot more time in this league because obviously there is no relegation. And again, when you talk about that, that's something that for me, my personal opinion is it's difficult as a manager, as a coach to create that winning mentality because the problem is some players will get comfortable because they don't have the fear of relegation you know phil obviously has been given a lot of time um we all know the connections with phil and obviously david beckham and you know the ownership group again um miami is a difficult market it's a difficult market to be you know successful in um it's it's for me what i've seen again of into miami um it's not been great you know again there's a lack of identity and there seems to be a real lack of belief in that team um, they've been trying to play a back three for a while and, and the back three really hasn't worked out. You know, they've just been all over the place, uh, lack of communication and, and understanding in that back three. And they're, they're very vulnerable. I think it's just how long this run may continue until maybe a decision might have to be made. Um, but they do get a lot more time in this league. And, um, you know, for, for some managers, they get the time to maybe turn it around and work it right. And, and some, it just may never turn around for them. Yeah, I mean, it it is going to be an awkward conversation between David Beckham and Phil Neville if he does have to uh, fire him as head coach. Um, you know, I mean, he did okay with the uh, the English ladies team, uh, Phil Neville. I mean, do you think, can, do, is that always not going to work very well when you, maybe an owner and the manager are close? Do you always need that sort of barrier between, between you? Do you know what I'm trying to say? I understand what you're saying, and I, I think um, you can look at so many different things in it. So I understand, but at the end of the day, these owners can hire whoever they want, and it's eventually they're going to have to make a decision because fans are going to have their say. So regardless of which way you look at it, there is always going to be that. And um, I don't think that he'll. I don't think he'll probably. I don't think he'll get sacked. I think he'll probably just resign, or they'll have a conversation like that. But. Um, it's a difficult situation to be in. Again, at the end of the day, if you want to really be competitive and you want to win, then you're going to have to make tough decisions. And sometimes that's the problem you're going to have if you hire someone that you're close to or you know someone that you're friendly with and things don't go right. You have, at the end of the day, a football club to be successful. And if you're not being successful, not winning football matches, that's what it boils down to. So, Nigel, thanks so much for coming on to the show. We really do appreciate it. I've loved seeing you on MLS Season Pass. But just before you go, I want to ask you about this. It's, it's come out in the last few days that uh, the UEFA Champions League are looking at perhaps playing some games in the US. I know the Premier League has kind of flirted with the idea as well a few years ago. As someone who is now sort of based over there, is that something you can see 
uh, being a success or would you still rather uh, the matches be played in the home territory, if you will? I would say it would be a success for sure. I don't agree to it. I think that for me, the UEFA Champions League should be played in Europe because that's where these clubs are and that's where their fans are. I think that if they can sell the experience to make American fans want to go to a Champions League final, that should be their job. But you can't take away a competition from clubs and, 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 and cities in Europe where these teams get to the final and put it in a different continent. You know, that's just typical football greed, in my opinion. It's all about the money, as we always know. Um, and it's interesting because now they want to move the UEFA Champions League final to America, but yet they're talking about bringing in a uh, wage cap in Europe. So if you want to bring in a wage cap in Europe, why are you moving UEFA Champions League outside of your continent and into America? So what? You can make more money and make more revenue, but yet you want to bring a wage cap for the players. So... Football is just a world of great contradictions at times by these leaders of the game. And uh, I disagree with it. I think that for me, it should be kept in Europe and it should be fans over here to want to go over there to experience the atmosphere there. Because it won't be the same atmosphere if you bring it here. And I think a lot of fans over there of what teams get to the final are going to have a lot to say about that with their football club and also with uh, UEFA. So UEFA could probably be digging themselves into a bigger hole. Nigel, thanks so much for joining us on the MLS UK show. As I said before, it's a real pleasure of mine just because you are a former Bolton player. But also, I've really enjoyed watching you and, and hearing you uh, talk on uh, Apple TV's coverage with MLS Season Pass. So thanks so much. Hopefully we get to speak to you again very soon and enjoy the rest of the season. Appreciate it. Thank you. Elliot Holman, Henry Hewitt. MLS UK show. So there we go. That was my chat with Nigel Rio Coca. Um, you know what? I think his personality on the pitch of what I remember was that he was quite like a, a stern faced, very professional guy. So going into the interview, I was a bit like, okay, I, I don't want to annoy him. I need to make sure yeah. everything's, I mean, you've got to make sure everything's all right anyway, but you know, i got to make sure over, you know, explain, go, okay, well just to let you know, like, you know, this and that. And he was just like, Henry, it's fine. Just, do it. It's fine. Don't worry about it. And I was like, oh, and it really relaxed me. So hopefully that came across in the chat. Thank you to Nigel for joining us on the MLS UK show. So now we've had him. We've had Gillian Sakovitz. I think we're trying to make our way through the uh, Apple TV MLS season pass uh, crew. What do you think? I am absolutely very, very happy for us to start making our way through the uh, Apple TV season plus uh, season pass, even season past cast um i've got a few ideas if i want next i'll tell you that i will tell you that for free well keep them to yourself just in case we don't get them uh and then the next person we speak to we can go well this is who elliot was thinking about obviously um but uh, don't forget obviously mls season pass is available on apple tv uh, you can sign up for the season or pay monthly uh, it's also available if you're not on apple tv if you're not an apple subscriber uh, or an apple user you can go on the website and you can get it from there as well so it's easily accessible and of course as we've said millions of times before this season it's such a good product uh, we're not just saying that because we're coming off the back of an interview with one of our guys but it is a such a good product it's made mls better to consume and it doesn't just show uh, the mls matches you also get the preview shows the countdown the wrap up uh, all of that and also uh, you get to watch uh, mls next pro as well um, and the all-star game will be on there as well as mls cup playoffs so uh, yeah apple tv if you're an apple user or go to the apple tv website if you're not and you can still get it from there uh, right elliot now uh, just to end this episode we had a question come in on our instagram so a shout out um, to uh, a new follower of ours rj nelson this is what he had to say he said i'm a brand new listener uh, he's two shows in and a stoppage time and he really enjoys it so thank you rj um he said it's nice to hear his perspective from the other side of the pond uh, about mls in such a positive manner i'm a founding member slash season ticket holder of atlanta united so obviously i uh, i thought well yeah you just need to save that and you can get on our show uh, but that's why he found us because he uh, he obviously saw our jillian sakovitz interview um he's got two questions though the first one um what is what are your opinions of mls referees 
compared to that of championship level level referees. Uh, you can tell he's a new listener of our show because we do talk about referees a lot and you like to talk about referees a lot and the quality of referees. So Elliot, I'll pass this on to you. Well, interesting though, because it's an interesting question. It's maybe not something that we've specifically touched on. Um, yes, refereeing in, in MLS has historically been very poor. Um, I think recently it's got a lot better. Um, my biggest gripe is is VAR, not the use of it, but the way it's interpreted um, and, and the lack of consistency. But interestingly, the question from RJ was about how uh, we'd compare it to championship referees. Well, championship, championship referees are, are dreadful, like really, really bad. Um, I, I, I've got no qualms in in saying that the quality of refereeing in MLS is is better than the championship, to be honest. I've witnessed some absolute shockers, not just this season, but seasons past as well um, at Carroll Road. So um, no, I'm, I'm, I'm more than happy to, <laughs> to give MLS a little bit of credit in that, uh, in that particular instance. Yeah, well, I've got to say that at least uh, MLS referees have VAR. Obviously, championship don't. Um, I mean... When you, you know, a lot is said at the moment in the US about the uh, the tier system in English football. Of course, Wrexham got promoted. Uh, well, Bolton in League One, uh, the refereeing doesn't get any better, I've got to say. It's probably even worse than the Championship, which is why, having secured their playoff spot this week, I really hope Bolton get promoted just to have slightly better referees. Um, but yeah, I get your point. And uh, I think, yeah, there's many instances, and I think it's highlighted a lot more in this country through the Championship is when a decision goes wrong. Um, but uh, yeah, I think refereeing on the whole, it's, it's a difficult job. Of course it is, especially in this country because of the amount of abuse that they get. Um, you know, it must be very difficult. You've got to be really passionate to do it. But uh, yeah, at the same time, it, yeah, something needs to be done. And in MLS, you know, it's, it's yeah, if you do have VAR, but su- surprisingly, there's some poor decisions. So I just think the quality of refereeing all over the world is probably quite poor actually and something needs to be done to help them out and address it um right the second question would you consider american rivalries not in the same city but the uh, rivalries that mls like to uh, portray um be better coined as a derby or just stay as a rivalry i do myself consider them rivalries and not a derby i.e atlanta orlando atlanta nashville atlanta charlotte to name a few uh we have again we spoke about the uh, rivalries in MLS. What do you think, Elliot? Because I guess Orlando started with Atlanta. Now they've moved on to Miami. Um, I, do you think that there's, there's too much made of it? Should they just keep with the, with the local derbies? Um, it's actually a really interesting point that I, I hadn't thought about. Um, the derby versus rivalry. Uh, rivalry is a very MLS term. Yeah, you know, we don't have that over here really in in the UK. I wouldn't I wouldn't say. I understand the use of it, but I don't think we use it in everyday life in terms of the Premier League and, and the Championship. Um, Orlando, you mentioned Atlanta before Miami. I think Miami is a is a derby. It's the Florida derby. Um, I think a rivalry makes sense in the context of a team that's outside of your your state. Um, but remember, Orlando started with NYCFC. They came into the league together and, and they were desperate that for, for those to be rivals for some unknown reason. And then Atlanta came in and it, that became a thing. I, I don't, I, that's what I don't like about MLS. We don't need that. I love MLS. I love seeing Orlando play anyone. I love on a random Sunday night, I'll watch Philadelphia play Houston. I don't care. I, I just want to watch it. I, I don't need that. It feels very sort of from a marketing perspective. Um, of course, I want to beat Miami. You know, the Florida Derby is the first time I've really cared about a rivalry. The, the, the Orlando-Atlanta thing was more because Henry's an Atlanta fan rather than the fact that they're sort of geographically slightly close. Um, so, yeah, Derby, Derby I prefer based on, you know, geographical location. And let's, let's, try, and, let's try and keep that for real special games rather than just every other week it being a rivalry with someone um you know let's let's keep that for for teams that are geographically close um and you know yeah sure over time we'll get you know philadelphia and lafc for example that's a rivalry that we're starting to see really pop off isn't it 
they just tell their own story over time. Don't force it. Yeah, I think uh, you're right there. I think MLS is is a relatively very young league compared to others, say in the UK, and and these rivalries slash derbies in the UK as you know as well. I mean, there's you know the UK, England is a very small country, yet we have hundreds of you know of teams. Like we've got ninety two teams in the the Premier League and the Football League, so those teams are quite close together. You know, I live in uh, Manchester, Bolton's 10 miles down the road. And within 50 miles, we've got the two Manchester teams, Liverpool, Everton, Leeds. Um, and then, you know, your Blackburns, Burnleys, you know, all these teams in one area. Leeds as well are within 50 miles. So you do have that local rivalry there uh, that you can get passionate about. And that has been over a 100 years. Whereas in MLS, it is, uh, you know, the teams are more spread out. It's... Uh, They've not had as much time to develop these rivalries. So, yeah, I think it'll come with time. You'll naturally get your derbies in New York and L.A., um, you know, that will be, and, and Texas, that will be uh, looked at in local rivalries. It's city versus city uh, that people can get very passionate about. Um, but then, yeah, we like the LAFC and Philadelphia one and, and there are plenty of others that are developing around the league. I think that when you, uh, over time, that's when, these bigger rivalries will start to develop amongst uh, teams that are perhaps in different conferences or at the other end of the country to each other. Um, so we'll, uh, we'll, we'll be there as these rivalries develop. Thank you, RJ, for your question. If you've got a question for us, uh, then send it in. He sent it on Instagram at MLS UK show. You can send it on Twitter as well. Uh, TikTok or email us hello at MLS dot show. Uh, right, Elliot, it's time to do our predictions for this weekend. Uh, the last time we did predictions was uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, it was 1-1 in the series. Would you like to have a guess at who's winning now? You. Uh, no, actually, it was a draw. We both got oh. 40 points, so we're back at 1-1 uh, still. Uh, right, this weekend then, uh, let's have a look at the fixtures. It all kicks off um, on sun- well, Sunday night slash Saturday night. So- sorry, Sunday morning slash Saturday night. Um, Sunday morning here in the UK it's Charlotte versus New York City who's winning this one Elliot? Uh, yeah tough game to start with actually um, I, I'm probably I'm probably going to go with a narrow NYCFC victory away so I'll probably go 2-1 uh, well this is the, I've just seen this is the free game on Apple TV this week so if you are watching this without subscribing then you can uh, have a taster through this one um, I'm going to go with I'm going to go with a Charlotte win. I'm going to go 1-0. Yeah, tough one to call that. Uh, Cincinnati are at home against uh, an informed DC United. This is probably not as uh, clear-cut as you may imagine, but I'm going to go for a, for a Cincinnati 3-2 victory. Yeah, you're right. DC are playing very well at the moment. I'm going to go 2-0 Cincy, though. I think they'll have enough at home. They're playing well. But yeah, credit to Wayne Rooney and DC. They're playing well. And this is interesting. Miami who scored their first goal away from home, got their first points away from home, uh, won their first game in five or six weeks uh, against a really, really strong Columbus team at the weekend, and now at home against Atlanta, who, all jokes aside, have looked poor the last couple of games. Um, this is this is going to be a really interesting game, and I'm just waffling because I've got no clue anymore. I would have backed Atlanta this time last week. Yeah, Atlanta. Not a clue now. Um, I'm I'm going to go for a one-all draw. You know what? I was, uh, after last week's stoppage time episode, I was thinking uh, where we were saying it's time up for Phil Neville and then obviously they go to Columbus and, won, and win. I was like, oh, should I do a big thing about, oh, Pineda needs to go. Maybe that'll uh, get Atlanta <laughs> the win. And then I thought, well, each week we say Peter Vermees needs to go from Sporting KC and that's not yeah. helping them. So, uh that theory's out the window. Um, I do. I think Atlanta will do well, but I think we'll win 2-1. Uh, although I do think uh, if there's a time for Mr. Martinez to score for Miami, it's going to be this weekend. Absolutely. Um, this is actually, a, this is, it's a tough week, actually. This is difficult. Montreal are at home. So they had a bad start to the season, but um, it's because they hadn't really played any home games. Um, so now you think, are they going to be all right? Still missing, uh, you know, lost a lot of players. Um, Orlando, bizarrely, one of the best teams on the road, if not statistically the best team on the road in the East. Bizarre. Um, so I'm going to go for a, a 2-1 Orlando win. 
Um, I can't really carve this, so I'm going to go 1-1, one, one, sit on the fence. Okay. Um, I think uh, uh, before this weekend, Orlando were one of the worst teams in the East at home and the best team in the East away. Bizarre. Um, New York Red Bulls host Philly. Um, there's, a, there's a little bit of a derby uh, geographically. Yeah. Um, difficult, this. Uh, New York not been good. I'm going to go... A, a lot of strong teams are playing away, which does make it difficult. Um, I'm going to go 2-2. Two, two. Uh, I think with Philly travelling to LA and then back up to New York within a few days, I think that'll take its toll on them. Uh, I think Red Bulls will win this 2-1. Uh, okay. Uh, is he going to think the same about LAFC or in action midweek? They're then on the road, still in California though, against San Jose. Uh, this is a 2-0 LAFC win for me. Yeah, I mean, you know, if they were in the UK, this is probably the equivalent of driving all, you know, halfway down the country. For them, it's around the corner in the US. I think, uh, yeah, I think LAFC will be fine. I think they'll win. Uh, I mean, San Jose have been doing all right, but I think LAFC will win 3-1. Yeah, it's not really a slight on San Jose who are who are having a good season. Uh, Toronto host New England Revolution. This again, this is really tough this week. Um, I'm going to go 2-1 Toronto. 2-2. Uh, two, two. I think uh, Toronto have had a few 2-2s two, recently and uh, I think they'll have another one. Okay. Uh, FC Dallas face St. Louis City FC who have been without Klaus up top and starting to show a little bit, but I think... I think we get goals in this. I think it's going to be 2-1 Dallas. Um, so, I mean, St. Louis, uh, have, they, they keep on pulling results out of the bag uh, where we don't surprise them. I think they'll do it again. I think it'll be a 2-1 to St. Louis. Mm, okay, Houston host RSL. Houston very, very good at home this season. Uh, I'm going to go 2-0. Yep, 2-1 to Houston. Uh, home farm continues. And uh, yeah, they, like San Jose, continue to surprise us. Nashville host Chicago Fire. Um, enjoyed watching uh, Nashville in the early early kickoff this weekend. I just because you know it's really nice to see an early kickoff. You know, it's perfect time for for England. You know, that's nothing to do with Atlanta. Um, I think this is a one nil narrow victory. Uh, yeah, I think Nashville win. Hani Mukhtar is getting back in farm as well. I think uh, I think it'd be comfortable. I think uh, three now. LA Galaxy in the West against Colorado. Um, just just really bad, aren't they? <laughs> it's really bad. Um, two one LA Galaxy. I don't know why. Yeah, I'm I've, I'm looking at that Austin win a few weeks ago and uh, thinking it would be the same two nil. Um, but yeah, they need to build momentum, don't they, LA Galaxy, uh, before it's too late. So much green. Portland host Austin in the West in Rose City. And uh, I think this is a 3-1 Portland win. Yeah, I mean, Austin's farm hasn't been great, has it? Um, Portland at home, you'd always fancy them. Uh, so yeah, I'm going to go 2 now. I've spotted an easy one, finally, coming up. Uh, but first, Vancouver against Minnesota. Uh, Vancouver, good at home. Minnesota struggled all, quite a bit at home. Maybe better away. Um, I'm going to go 2-0 Vancouver. 1-1, uh, draw. Ooh. And finally, Seattle versus Peter Vermees and SKC. Um, has anyone ever predicted a double figures before? <laughs> uh, um, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go three nil Seattle. Uh, whenever Seattle play a team at the bottom, I tend to think it's going to be around the fours. So I'm going to stick with that four nil Seattle uh, SKC. Yeah. Um, I mean, it would be so MLS, the most MLS thing ever if SKC go to Seattle and win. But I just don't see it. Uh, four nil. Um, let us know your predictions at MLS UK show and uh, the week after in midweek it's the US Open Cup which we don't talk about but uh, good luck if your team is still in that um, before we go I need to reveal the answer to this week's game with a changing name have you got any idea on this? 
I don't, you know, I don't. I, I know that it's going to absolutely scream at me when when you say it, I'm going to be like, oh, of course, yeah. And uh, but I'm, I think the the way my thinking is, I'm trying to think of maybe a Dutch player, but now I'm thinking of a player who's in China, and then I'm, I don't really know who plays in China, so I'm confusing myself. So uh, rather than, um, yeah, rather than uh, just try and. I don't know, try and look too far in my memory uh, to try and find a player. I'm going to, I think I'm going to just tap out and say, no, don't know this one. Jürgen Lacadia. Yeah, well, any Brighton fans are probably screaming at their, through their headphones or their screen going, what, can you, how can you remember that he played 35 times for Brighton, for the Seagulls? Uh, but sorry, I don't. So, uh, yeah, well done if you got that. Um, when we record... Next, uh, the next game would have changed your name because we tend to do it in the afternoons. My brain would have woken up by then. We'll see. Um, okay, well, thank you very much to Nigel Rea Coker for, for coming on the show. And uh, thank you for mentioning Bolton 15 times in this very short episode. Um, I'm, I'm done. That's it. That's my limit. I'm spent. I'm out. Okay, well, just a shout out to our sponsor, Soccer90.com. Uh, remember, if you go to that website, Soccer90.com, Choose any uh, MLS shirts, international shirts, European shirts, any other apparel or accessories. At the checkout, type in MLS UK in the discount code. You get 20% off. Also, a, um, a request, really, more than anything, that if you are watching on YouTube, please subscribe. Please click the notification bell. Please like the video because it really does help. And if you listen on your podcast provider, uh, which the, the majority of you do, uh, then thank you. Uh, if you haven't subscribed, please subscribe. And if you're on Apple, oh, I think Spotify do them now. If you are going to leave us a rating, there's one rule and one rule only. Five stars only, LA Galaxy style. Yes. Thank you so much if you've done that already. Uh, but for now, that's it from us. I've been Henry Hewitt. And I've been Elliot Holman. We'll catch you very soon. See ya.